Good morning. Thanks so much for tuning in. Happy Friday to you. I'm Alex Matthew and with me is Cheryl D'Souza. This is Buy Now, Sell Now on ET Now. Let's very quickly take you through what the markets are looking at at this point. We had a bit of catching up to do with the equity markets globally. Uh, of course, a lot of action in the U.S. markets on the back of that inflation trend and of course on the back of the U.S. jobs data that came in yesterday better than expected. But here in India, you have the equity markets, that particularly you have the uh, blue chip benchmarks treading water at this juncture. Uh, Nifty 50 down about a tenth of a percent or so, uh, just below that uh, 14,700 mark or thereabouts. And uh, the reason that you're seeing this is because there's a lot to catch up on. Uh, I'll very quickly take you through the sectoral picture. You have the banks that are down about a tenth of a percent auto and IT down about a percent or thereabouts. You have the pharma index that is underperforming as well, down about seven tenths of a percent. The biggest loser, of course, is a metal SPAC, which is down over 3% in trade. Uh, IT, uh, sorry, FMCG is doing reasonably well, but really among the nifty constituents, the two that uh, you would want to bear in mind uh, is our Asian paints as well as a UPL. Both of them looking really strong on the back of results. Let's take you through another counter that uh, is in focus on account of results. That's JSPL. And what a stellar set of numbers it's uh, reported. It's highest ever quarterly EBITDA and that has resulted in the reduction of debt uh, by close to 3,500 crore rupees in the fourth quarter. Let's uh, go across now to VR Sharma, the managing director of JSPL, uh, who's joining in to take a few questions on the fourth quarter. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sharma, for joining in and for taking the time. I want to start by asking about the fact that you've reported a record EBITDA and sales on the back of the surge in steel prices, what were the realizations like during the quarter? The internationally, the demand and appetite of steel has increased and that has increased the prices worldwide. And you know, it is a chain process and cascading effect. And when the steel prices, they go up because of the demand, then uh, the raw material prices, they also follow. There's always a time lag of about 10 to 15 days. And uh, when the raw material prices start falling, at that time also there is a time lag of about 10 to 15 days. Uh, now this is what has happened today, that internationally the prices are going up because of the demand. And uh, domestically in India, of course the prices have gone up. But uh, there is a difference of steel prices in India and in overseas. Like we are exporting at $1,000 plus, whereas we are selling in India at 750 uh, to $780 per ton uh, to the Indian market, to the domestic market. So this shows that uh, we are looking to retain our long-term customers uh, and to all of the MSMEs uh, so that we, uh, in, during thick and thin time, we are together. But yes, you are right. Uh, there, is a, there is an opportunity uh, selling steel in spot markets internationally and that uh, 30 to 35 percent and some companies even 40 percent, they are exporting to reap in the profits. This is what the story today. Good morning, Mr. Sharma. This is Cheryl also joining in. I uh, want to know when does the zero cost uh, Sarda iron inventory actually get exhausted? And also, how will it impact the margins given that, uh, given that uh, NMDC is now charging close to 7,000 rupees per ton for iron ore? You're right. Uh, NMDC has increased the prices. So are the other uh, companies like OMC or uh, and the private miners because uh, everybody uh, makes NMDC as a base and then depending on the quality and weight, they adjust their prices accordingly. And NMDC is also following the international trend. In the last uh, three weeks, the international the prices have gone up by $30. So uh, NMDC has followed the international trend. Tomorrow, if the international trend is softened and the prices they start falling down, then definitely NMDC will also reduce the prices. Now, coming back on our uh, results, you see, we are not banking upon on massive BL or Sardar Mines now. Uh, we are sitting in a, uh, in a uh, iron ore hub that is Odisha, and we have long term agreement at the with OMC. So, we are getting regular emission from them. We are also buying from NMDC. India is having abundant uh, uh, sources of uh, iron ore. We have more than 30 uh, billion tons of iron ore. We hardly uh, do the mining for about 300 or 350 million uh, tons. 
Out of that, about 100 million plus is exported and balance is unit within the country. So I think uh, there won't be any shortage. Uh, the, the mines are going to be mechanized further, and the iron ore will be available to anybody who wants to put up the plant or who are having the uh, existing plants. So there's no shortage of iron ore, and uh, the prices are market driven. So whatever the prices uh, will be at international level, and whatever the prices are finalized by NBC, that will become the benchmark for the Indian steel industry. Mr. Sharma, let's talk about the power business. When will uh, the power business divestment be completed? And also, will the entire uh, cash proceeds be used for debt reduction? Yeah, we are working now that GSP should focus only on steel business. And uh, steel has a potential and steel uh, will grow in times to come. Because country uh, is going to have more than 300 million tons steel consumption by 2030 per and the government uh, declaration and government is uh, what Mr. Steele has worked out the plan as to how to reach to 300 million ton of production as well as energy. So uh, looking to uh, the current scenario worldwide, we wanted to uh, reduce the overall carbon footprint and we wanted that uh, JSPL uh, should work as a very vibrant steel organization uh, than uh, uh, keeping uh, the coal consumption or the coal based on the power plant. And uh, that was the main reason for this particular divestment. As far as timing is concerned, this is going to take a couple of months' time because now it is only a board decision. And after that, we will be discussing with the statutory uh, authorities, we will be discussing with the uh, bankers of JPL, and we will be discussing with the consortium of all JSPL. And finally, this will be uh, uh, the decision will be given by SEBI. Once it goes through, then definitely uh, the deal will be finalized. Uh, subject to the approvals of uh, different statutory uh, requirements. I think this is going to take about three to four months' time uh, if everything goes well. So the last five years have seen a reduction of close to 20,000 crore rupees in debt. Are you comfortable now with the current leverage as it stands right now or is there further room for reduction? The plan is 15, 15, 15, 15,000 crore total debt, 15,000 crore and above is EBITDA, and 15,000 crores of sales and all. Uh, but uh, I'm sure uh, today our debt level is 19,300 crores. We are working, if everything goes well and as per plan, then we should bring down the debt in four figures. And uh, today it is in five figures. Uh, this is our aim. Uh, but yes, as a corporate planning, we have taken 15, 15, 15 uh, that we are maintaining and we will try to give the much better results uh, than what we declare in times to come. Uh, Mr. Sharma, you've targeted around 18,000 crore rupees of CAPEX over the next few years. What's the plan on funding of this? You see, uh, if you see our uh, balance sheet, uh, we had uh, uh, earned a net profit of more than 5,500 crores uh, this last year. GSP alone was 7,154 crores. And we are expecting that we'll be in a motion to maintain uh, a beta of 15,000 crores in times to come. And that means that will give us another 7,000 crores of PET on year on year basis. So we are not going to borrow any money. We are not going to uh, and take loans uh, for capex in the uh, next three, four year time. So we have taken a policy on an invest E and I, and that policy will remain uh, within the company, and we will not borrow any any money. So uh, from our accruals alone, we'll be doing this particular capex. So uh, eighteen thousand crores, but we are uh, we are we are declared, and what we are planning to invest in, and that will be done over a period of three years time. And we are comfortable with that. All right, Mr. Sharma, we leave it at there. Thank you for joining us this morning on ET Now and talking about your earnings, also the way forward for JSPL.
From one earnings uh, candidate to another one, and that is Mahindra Life Space, they also had announced their uh, Q4 earnings. And if you look at the earnings fine print, the loss is narrowed on a year on year basis. The revenue is coming at around 56 crore rupees versus 101.4 crore rupees on a year on year basis. Let talk, let's get the management on board and talk more about the quarter gone by as well as what's the outlook for FI22. So uh, joining us now is a uh, Mr. Arvind Subramanian, who is the MD and CEO of Mahindra Life for Space Developers. Good morning, Mr. Subramanian. Thank you for joining us on ET Now. Let's talk about the quarter gone by. Could you take us through the highlights of Q4 as well as how FI21 had panned out for Mahindra Life Spaces as well as uh, we've seen uh, the, uh, the loss so narrow in Q4, but are you seeing some uh, encouraging trends as well? You know, FY21 has really been a tale of uh, two cities, if I may borrow that phrase, uh, because it started with uh, a complete sense of uncertainty and gloom. And we were all just frozen in the headlands for the first four or five months. Uh, there was almost nothing we were able to do uh, and, and uh, we were finding our bearings. But uh, for the real estate market and residential business in particular, uh, there's been a sharp rebound since then. So over the uh, latter part of the year, particularly the fourth quarter, we have seen very brisk business, which augurs very well for uh, FY22. Despite the pandemic that we are currently caught in the midst of, uh, I think there are enough indicators in the pattern of business in FY21 to suggest that demand is robust and deep, and that should not be a worry. It's more around well-being of employees and uh, uh, how we build our supply chain, the resilience in the supply chain. So in Q4, we actually did more business put together than the first three quarters put together. And this is across both our businesses, our residential business, as well as our industrial business. So B2B and B2C both. Uh, Q4 was uh, larger than the sum of Q1, Q2, and Q3 put together, uh, which is extremely heartening. I think the highlight for us has been residential sales over the last year. Uh, we've done close to 700 crores of uh, net sales. And uh, what's even more heartening about that is that it has been a broad-based performance. Every single project has sold across price points, across locations, uh, and that's, that's been very encouraging. Let's talk about FI22. How has it started for the company, given that we are seeing actually a lot of localized lockdown due to uh, the COVID-19? Uh, are you seeing uh, the customer interest reduce? Also, if you could uh, tell us about uh, what are the planned launches that are there in the pipeline? Uh, look, as I said, uh, Q4 had picked up a very, very brisk pace for us. And, uh, you know, it's been a shame that we've had to hit the brakes so hard uh, towards the end of Q4 because of the challenges around us with the second wave of the pandemic. Uh, as we stand today, there is certainly very uh, subdued business, both from a demand side as well as uh, we are seeing uh, some challenges from a supply side, both labor availability as well as commodity price increases uh, that, that kind of worries me uh, going into the next year. Uh, as I said, I think demand will come back as and when uh, the, we have a possibility of opening up. I think demand will come back. Uh, the supply side takes a little more time to build back up. Uh, so the constant yo-yoing between high levels of activity on construction and then low levels um, it is much more challenging to deal with. Uh, we have built very strong capabilities over the last year to uh, conduct our sales online. In fact, we had done an entire new project launch in October completely online, what we called a zero touch sales, where we didn't meet any customer face to face. There was no site visit, there was no show flat. The entire launch was done uh, virtually using visualization tools and interaction tools with the customer. And we received very good response. Uh, and that has helped us build this capability to uh, engage with customers remotely and conclude the sale. It is not just about an inquiry, we are actually able to conclude the sale and even register the agreements digitally. Mr. Subramanian, a lot of companies are facing a rise in input pressure, input costs rather, and particularly in your sector, the increase in raw material costs like iron and steel is bound to pinch a little bit. Are you confident of passing on those price increases to the customer? 
Yes, to me, that is a bigger worry than demand, as I've been saying. I think demand is robust. It'll come back when the market opens up. Uh, the commodity price increase, you know, steel has gone from roughly 40,000 uh, rupees to 60,000 rupees a ton over this period. Uh, and that is a big challenge. Uh, we are tackling that through multiple uh, beavers. Uh, one is being very, very sharp about our design, being very efficient about our designs, continuously value engineering our designs, even after the initial design is done during the construction phase, trying to squeeze out a few percentage points of cost uh, every few months. Uh, but also structuring our contracts with our uh, suppliers and contractors in a manner that buffers some of these uh, cost inflations. And finally, look, we are choosing uh, very consciously to do smaller size projects so that we're not locked into a price and cost mismatch over a longer period. So we get in and get out of our projects quickly uh, so that even when there's a cost inflation, we're able to mitigate that impact because it's, uh, we're exposed to that for a shorter duration. Now, what are the key trends, Mr. Subramanian, that you've witnessed in Mahindra World City Centers across Chennai and Jaipur, uh, and the rental negotiations or renegotiation trends that you've seen uh, with a commercial clientele? How has that panned out uh, on account of what we've seen uh, starting in February with the second phase or the second wave of the pandemic? Yeah, so it's actually quite interesting. In our world cities, in both Chennai and Jaipur, uh, we've got very, very strong positive feedback from our clients that we were able to reopen these world cities for operations much quicker than other facilities in the neighborhood uh, because of the kind of operations and management capabilities we have, the protocols we were able to put in place for the safety of the workers and employees who are coming into the world cities. So in fact, uh, from a business continuity and resilience standpoint, uh, these two facilities have become case studies in their local administrations on how we can quickly get people back to work, to productive economic activity. Uh, so, uh, so because of that, actually, there's been no pressure on pricing in those businesses. Now, if one were to take a step back and look at it from a bit more of a macro picture, I think with all that's happening across the world, uh, with the realignment of global supply chains to become more regional, uh, with uh, China getting a little bit isolated in the global supply chains, and the policy thrust in India with things like uh, the production-linked incentive scheme and Atmanirbhar Bharat. The next few years, uh, to my mind, could really be a golden period for manufacturing in India. And if, does, if that does play out as the uh, promise holds, our world cities and origins, uh, the four industrial parks that we have, uh, stand head and shoulders above the competition in terms of infrastructure readiness and uh, speed to market in terms of being able to set up your facility very quickly and start production very quickly. All right. Thanks, Mr. Subramanian, for taking the time, for answering our questions. I wish you all the best for the year uh, to follow. On that note, we're taking a short break, but on the other side, we've got a lot more in store for you, so do stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Buy Now, Sell Now on ET Now. And let's bring on board our experts for today. We have Jay Thakkar as well as Vijay Chopra joining us. Good morning, uh, Vijay, as well as uh, Jay. Thank you for joining us on ET Now. Uh, Jay, I'll come first to you. Let's talk about what are your high risk and low risk guys to the viewers today. Hi, very good morning to you. Uh, well, I have uh, two buy recommendations. Uh, one is of medium risk, and uh, that is uh, Madri Specialty Chemicals Limited. That is uh, I'm sorry, that is, um, you know, uh, 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 the first buy recommendation that I have is on, uh, is a low risk trade rather, I would say, is uh, a CCL product. One can buy CCL product targeting around 350 to 400. Uh, you know, I think that the way the stock has, in fact, provided a breakout from a symmetrical triangle pattern, it is a, you know, a classic breakout in its, in its wave two formation that we have seen. And, um, you know, the way the momentum indicators, in fact, has pro have provided a buy crossover, the, the way the you know, volumes have expanded, it clearly indicates that the stock has provided a 
a good breakout not only for the short term but also for the medium term point of view the move prior to this consolidation was a clear uh, five wave rising structure that is an impulsive move post that impulsive move we have seen this consolidation for nearly six months and in this six months it formed a nice symmetrical triangular pattern post which it provided a breakout and now i think from here on uh, you know uh, one can see the levels of almost 350 to 400 so i i would recommend to buy ccl products this is a low risk uh, trading idea and i think one can uh, you know buy this with a play, you know stop loss at around 270 so that's my first buy recommendation the second buy recommendation which i have is a, you know, a medium risk uh, you know idea and that is on ram krishna forging i might have mistakenly shared it as hscl but that is ram krishna forging that is rk forging now if we look at the chart structure of rk forging you know rk forge you know uh, it has provided a very nice breakout from a rectangular pattern and the move prior to that was quite an impulsive move that's a clear swift move that we had seen and thereafter the stock is provided a breakout from this rectangular pattern with a clear buy crossover in its momentum indicators as well as clear increase in its volumes since past one quarter if we see the volumes have been expanding in rk forging and this breakout has come after a fourth wave consolidation so fifth wave in the medium term seems to have started in rk forge so one can buy RK Forge, one can target around 750 in the short term, but positional point of view, one can also target around 875. One can place a stop loss at 550. So if you risk, uh, look at the risk reward, then it's nearly around one is to two risk reward on RK Forging, which is quite good as far as positional idea is concerned. So that would be my medium term or medium risk idea, RK Forging, and the low risk idea was uh, CCL products. All right, let's uh, go across to Vijay Chopra now. Uh, uh, Vijay, sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to keep it a little short because we've already got several queries lined up. Uh, what are your ideas for us today? Well, I think that there are three ideas I'm going to share today. Uh, my first recommendation would be a buy call on Engineers India. The stock is trading around 80 rupees and I think that it, it is uh, ripe and it can go up to 90 rupees and there's a decent return in store. And this is a low risk idea. Engineers India, as all of us know, is a government of India company and uh, uh, has a fantastic auto book and is a cash rich company as well. My second recommendation would be a buy call on KRBL, which is presently trading at around 230. And I think that, you know, we are heading into a time when we'll see uh, some kind of, a, uh, you know, inflationary pressure on even food items. And we are seeing in edible oils what has happened. In sugar, we have seen a decent run up. I think that, you know, the, the, the rice stocks are going to uh, be next. So KRBL seemingly looks very ripe and it's a medium risk idea and uh, presently at 230 it can go up to 260 to 70. My final recommendation would be again a buy call on, um, on Union Bank. It's a medium to high risk uh, call. I think that there is something which is uh, going to come in the, uh, you know, uh, for, for the BSU banks. So presently trading at about 36, 37, it can inch up to 45, 46. So Union Bank is my, my recommendation. So there are some good stocks, undervalued stories, which can still be picked up. And although we have seen a decent run up in, um, in mid caps, but I see a lot of opportunity uh, in the mid cap space, although large cap space would take a breather. So be very cautious, keep on booking profits because markets are, uh, you know, uh, you know, we are not seeing a, a, an up move. We are not seeing a trigger for an up move. So internationally also as inflation is um, going up, we might see interest rates hardening or uh, some kind of an action from the central banks. So be very cautious, I would say, and be in undervalued stories and preferably commodity related uh, companies. Right, point taken, and that is uh, the uh, the ideas coming in from Vijay as well. We request Jay and Vijay, both of you all, just to keep your answers very short when we are going getting into the query segment, as we have a lot of a lot of viewer queries actually pouring in uh, today. Uh, I'll start first with uh, Mahesh uh, Vaidyanathan uh, on the on YouTube. He's asked. Uh, HCL Tech, how does it look at current levels for the longer term? He's been holding this particular counter uh, for, since it has been at uh, 800 odd levels. He believes that it's a dark horse in the IT sector. Do you concur with that view, Vijay? Does it make sense to uh, look at HCL Tech at current uh, valuations for the longer term? Well, I think it's a good stock. Uh, the stock is showing some signs of consolidation, and I think that 
around these levels, there is no, uh, the risk reward is definitely positive. And once it starts moving up and we see some kind of a you know, breather in the market, uh, whenever we see interest rates getting hardened or markets getting confused, so the money shifts to the conservative sectors like IT and pharma. So I, HCL Tech is consolidating very nicely around 900 or 900 odd levels. I think once it starts moving, it can definitely move up to 1100. So no panic at all. Just keep on hanging around, and IT should do well in the in the next quarter. Uh, you mentioned one bank, uh, 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 Vijay. I'm coming back to you on this one. Uh, Vikram has got a question on PNB. He's already acquired the bank at levels of 54 rupees. Should he book loss or move um, uh, or hold on to the stock? Well, I think that you know PNB, although it is one of the largest banks, but I am not very happy or you know I'm, I would say I would be skeptic on the asset quality of PNB over the years quarter on quarter we have not seen PNB uh, giving any heartening uh, you know uh, results and uh, they have not shown improvement on the asset quality uh, and I, it, it's been a number of years I think so you know three to four years I have been watching PNB and it's not doing well at all so I would prefer uh, a Canara bank or a bank of Badoda or a union bank as I mentioned uh, if you want to see on the private side, you know, HDFC Bank, Kotak Bank are much better bets if somebody wants to make money. The idea is to make money and make money safely. It's not to punt. So PNB, <clears throat> I would say, you know, is not as interesting as other banks. And there are good opportunities in the banking space as well, as I mentioned, a lot of PSBs and SBI. You know, why not get into an SBI rather than PNB? Because SBI is, is the largest bank and I think that at these valuations looks convincing as well. So uh, whenever you see a fall in SBI, go into an SBI, maybe you can book loss in PNB, but you will make money elsewhere. So why to risk your capital? Next, we have viewer queries come from Shanmuga Sundaram, saying that he has 20 shares of GMM Fordler that he's purchased at 4,200 rupees per share. He wants to know whether he can continue to hold on to the stock for the next six months. Uh, Jay, how does the chart for GMM uh, Fordler look like? Makes sense to continue to hold on to this counter over the next six, uh, six months? I would say for the six months time frame, uh, I would not recommend to hold this stock. But for the short term, say maybe for a month or two months, I would say one can hold on to this stock. One can see the levels of around say five thousand to fifty two hundred in the short term. I mean, I would say the way the stock has uh, you know uh, you know formed a nice consolidating pattern above its two hundred demo as well as fifty demo. In fact, has provided a breakout out of uh, it as well with an increase in volumes. This can take the stock to 55,000 to 5,200, uh, say within a time, you know, within a month or two. But uh, you know, for six months, I would not recommend to hold on. So whenever you know, one see a bounce till uh, 5,000 to 5,200 levels, one can take profits out of it. Okay, uh, Vijay, coming to you on this next one, we had the management of JSPL on the channel not too long back, and uh, there were some interesting points being made about the uh, the. Uh, uh, selling off the power business and uh, reduction of debt and all of that. Sentil is asking, should you invest at current levels for a period of two years? Well, I think, you know, JSPL from almost 100 rupees, we have seen almost 500 rupees. So 500 percent, uh, you know, if, if some stock goes up in a year's time, I think that uh, to be fair to the company and, uh, you know, we, we need to see the, uh, the stock price coming down. Although there's no problem with the company at all. They have, show, uh, they have posted blockbuster results. All the steel companies, Tata Steel, JSPL, JSW, these are great companies to have in a portfolio. But again, if you want to enter now, I would recommend that just wait for some time. Let it come near maybe, uh, you know, 350 odd levels, if at all, we find it in a, um, you know, in a correction. It would be a great uh, time to enter, you know, 350 to 370 odd levels. You can get there, get into the stock there and just hang around. I think that, you know, JSPL is heading far above and we'll see this stock going going to maybe 800 900 levels if somebody holds with two to three years perspective because i see a long-term rally in the metals and uh, all these top companies whether it's Tata steel jsw jindal steel uh, you know jindal saw jsl hisar all these companies are going to do fantastically well over a period of two to three years but yes just we, we are seeing some profit booking and if they, you're making a fresh entry wait for some time and, and we'll find lower levels and then uh, i think that around uh, you know, as I said, 350 to 370 is a is a level where uh, I think would be a great entry level to get into JSPL. Uh, so great company, great results, and I see metals, you know, doing good over a period of next two to three years. Right. 
The next query is coming in from Joby Sebastian saying that he's holding on to Godrej Agrovet, uh, which he purchased at 560 rupees per share. It's, he, he's been holding him, uh, holding this particular counter for a longer term. He wants to know whether he should continue to hold on to the sh uh, stock or shift to another stock. Jay, what's your view coming in on Godrej uh, Agrovet? I think one can continue holding this stock. It's a nice stock and technically this stock has clearly provided a breakout from a downtrend line resistance. Also, the stock has formed a nice inverse head and shoulders pattern. This stock is likely to inch towards the levels of say around 620 in the short term. Positionally, I think, um, you know, for the longer term rather, I would say the stock is likely to, you know, move above the levels of 700, 720. Okay. Um, I all right, so let's uh, take another question. Then we've got a question from Shub Mathur coming in on EID Parry. Uh, he says uh, that he bought uh, Jay, he bought this at a peak of uh, 441. He's asking if he should average or if he should wait for a few days in the hope of a better level to enter or average. Uh, you know, enter it right away because you know the stock has corrected since past couple of trading sessions and it has in fact provided a very nice breakout above the levels of 375 so that should be the stop loss now going forward 375 i think the stock will bounce back anytime soon now because it had provided a breakout above 375 with an increase in volumes and in fact entire sugar pack and in fact performed quite well and uh, provided a breakout a uh, positional point of view so i think uh, with the stop loss of 375 one can enter add on to this stock and we can see the stock moving about 475 in the you know uh, short to medium term. Okay, um, the next question is uh, the very definition of why investors should look at investing for the long term uh, into quality stocks. Uh, we've got a, a question from Sagar and this one's for you Vijay. He's got into PGHH. This is uh, Procter & Gamble uh, Hygiene and Healthcare. Uh, rather his father bought uh, at levels of 2,000 rupees, 5,000 shares. The stock is currently trading over 13,500 or close, in fact, to 13,600. Uh, they've been holding for nearly a decade. Should he hold on for another decade is the question. Well, I think that, you know, stocks like Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Gillette, uh, you know, these are portfolio stocks. And I think that, uh, you know, nothing goes wrong in them. You know, we see the crests and troughs of the market, markets crashing and, you know, people, uh, you know, selling the stocks in a panic. The last 10 years, if he's holding, he must have seen at least two, three major crashes and this guy has not uh, shown any kind of a panic. So if he doesn't need money, it's a portfolio stock, according to me. And, you know, <clears throat> such stocks are passed from generations to generations. Uh, but, you know, there are great opportunities coming in the market elsewhere as well. So, uh, you know, there are, it would be a good idea if somebody can book half, they have been, you know, sitting around for 10 years. So, you know, they can, they can get into good uh, companies. Another recommendation I would like to make is Coromandel International. It's a, uh, you know, Murugappa Group company. And I see a lot of uh, steam uh, in the fertilizer space around the agri, as I mentioned, around the agri space. So, you know, or, or a stock like Godrej Agrovet, you know, uh, somebody can and buy into the stock and just hang around for uh, for a decade and you know there is huge money to be made as i mentioned about metals as well so again uh, great i would like to congratulate the, the gentleman who has held on to the stock but uh, if at all you see a rally you at least book half and get into some other good story and you know there would be great chances of making a good amount of money All right, our next uh, query is coming in from Rajesh. This is an email query that we've got. Uh, he's saying that he's holding on to uh, Coal India shares, which is about 1,000 shares that he bought around at 157.6 rupees per share. He wants to uh, know what should he do with this uh, stock. The time horizon, uh, time horizon is six to one year. Uh, Jay, six to one, uh, six, I beg your pardon, six months to one year. How does the chart look for Coal India? The way the stock has recovered recently, I think, you know, uh, from the six months point of view, I think it will, uh, six months to one year rather, I would say it would, it's likely to inch towards the levels of 170 to 190. So one can continue holding to this stock. Okay, now a number of people have asked about sale and I think uh, Vijay has made his view very uh, clear on the counter. So I want to go across to Jay. Jay, on the technicals, uh, what are the charts indicating to you? 
In the way uh, the stock has provided a breakout and the way the metal cycle has in fact reversed, uh, no, I think sale uh, corrections should be utilized as a buying opportunity. I would say, see, we have seen some profit booking from higher levels since past couple of trading sessions, I would say, and we have seen metals in fact dragging down Nifty as well. But from the short term point of view, short to medium term point of view, I would say that sale has a very good support at around 100. So 100 positionally would be a very good support for sale. I don't think it will break those levels. So, you know, overlap those levels and, you know, we would see this stock recovery. It might consolidate for some more time. It might, you know, correct some more uh, from year on as well. But I don't see it going below levels of 100 from year on. So one can use this dip as a buying opportunity or cumulate this because I think the overall, uh, you know, metal rally has uh, just started, in fact, I would say from the long term point of view because the metal index has provided a breakout from a double bottom pattern. Coming in from Sa uh, Santi uh, Cherela, say, uh, talking about uh, intellect design arena, saying that the stock is currently uh, trading at the support level of 690 to 700 rupees uh, price, bra uh, price band after it's fallen from the recent highs of 850 rupees per share. So wants to know whether it's a good uh, time to buy uh, uh, intellect design at the pro price points of 700 rupees per share and 650 rupees per share before we can see it uh, climb to the recent high levels. Ajay, this one is for you. Okay. I think, see, you know, overall intellect design seems to have run up quite a lot. And I, I see, you know, as far as the momentum indicators are concerned, it's looking quite overbought. And I can see some negative divergence as well out here on intellect design. So I would rather recommend to, you know, book profit out of it and wait for some correction, uh, uh, you know, on intellect design, I would say, because uh, we seems to, you know, it, it seems to be, have completed a clear five-wave rising structure. And the recent... Uh, you know, uh, reversal which we have seen now on the weekly charts, if you see today is a weekly close as well, I see a clear dark cloud cover formation on this stock. In fact, on a weekly basis, the stock is down by 9% and it's forming a dark cloud cover candlestick pattern. This clearly indicates that there is a very high probability of a reversal from here on, at least from the short term point of view. And after a, such a strong run up, we can see a retracement at least coming on this stock until the levels of around say 590 to 550 levels which must be around, say, you know, 20, uh, 10 to 15 percent from year on. So 15 percent correction further from these levels cannot be ruled out. Okay, uh, I'm coming to you on this uh, next one, uh, uh, Vijay, and, and, and this has to do with uh, a stock that you will probably also call a portfolio stock. Uh, this is Asian Paints, and the stock is absolutely flying in trade today. Naresh has got a question on this. He's bought 32 shares at 2,420. He's asking if we should hold on and we should uh, book profits at this juncture. Uh, well, you know, these are great companies. I was listening to Saurav Mukherjee's uh, one of the presentation where he said that Asian Paints is one of the companies which has consistently grown 20% uh, over uh, a period of last 20 years. How many companies uh, do we have like this? So again, I think that this gentleman is a medium term, short term investor. So he can look at 2800, 2900 and then exit there. But if you ask me, uh, you know, Asian Paints again is a portfolio stock and uh, these kind of stocks should be bought into in any kind of a correction and uh, held on to, you know, again, passed on from generations to generations. And these are very stable companies. This doesn't matter that if it, even a, a shock like COVID could not, you know, um, disturb a, a, a chart like Asian Pens. And there are many such companies where, you know, they came back uh, very, very sharply. So I always say good stocks are like tennis balls and bad stocks are like eggs. So it's a great tennis ball, a portfolio tennis ball. So if at all you want to book out, book out around 2800, 2900, otherwise keep on holding it in your portfolio. All right. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank both you, uh, Vijay, uh, as well as uh, Jay for, for taking all the questions that you did uh, take. And to the viewers who've tuned in and who've not got their queries answered, I'm terribly sorry uh, for, uh, uh, for, for that fact. Uh, but we'll be back on Monday and we'll take more queries. We promise to take as many as we possibly can. Uh, we're slipping into a short break. Uh, we've got more on the other side, so do stay tuned.
Welcome back. You're watching Buy Now, Sell Now on ET, uh, ET Now. And now time for uh, the BNSN Quiz uh, Champion. And the question that we asked you today was which of these large private sector banks has returned uh, the most to shareholders over the past 10 years? And the options were ICICI Bank, Axis Bank, HDFC Bank and Kotak Mahindra Bank. And the right answer is Kotak Mahindra Bank. And the winners for today's BNSN Quiz and the champions are Rochelle Segal, Jani as well as Alok Singh. Congratulations to all three of you. And then let's talk about Happiest Minds. They had come out with their Q4 earnings. And if you look at uh, the way how the picture looks like, their dollar revenue saw an uptick of 15.4% on a quarter and quarter basis. Their revenue was higher by about 14.5% on a quarter and quarter basis. However, the, their PAT saw a decline of about 14.5% on a quarter and quarter basis. But let's talk more about the earnings and the way forward going ahead for Happiest Minds with their management. We are joined by uh, Venkat Raman Narayanan as well as Joseph uh, Anant Raju of Happiest Minds. Good morning, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us on ET Now. Uh, first of all, congratulations on a strong uh, Q4 for Happiest Mind. Could you tell us what actually led uh, to the strong performance? Uh, as we have been saying right from the beginning, uh, the demand situation for digital IT services across the entire digital spectrum has been uh, kind of uh, expanding at a very rapid space, pace and uh, that being exactly the area that we are working in, we are able to uh, grab as much as is coming to our in our direction. So that's really driving the uh, expansion in our revenues. Second thing is also we have had this acquisition of PIMCOR Global Services that we did uh, last year and which, which concluded early part of Q4 that that's been integrated very well and that's also in a hot e-commerce area that's also adding to the demand and that that acquired business is also doing pretty well so if you give me an over if to give you an overarching uh, picture on the demand very healthy both from existing clients and new clients and uh, we have added about 23 new clients this quarter and about eight of them billion dollar corporations so all of this is adding uh, to the expectation for uh, more work to be delivered by happiest minds and just giving some color uh, you know to uh, to uh, the growth that venkat was talking about uh, the the heartening factor is that it's been quite broad based uh, if you look at all our geos they've exhibited growth uh, q4 over q3 and our verticals as well have uh, you know across the board have uh, grown a couple of things i want to call out uh, middle east as you would see from our fact sheet has grown as a percentage of revenue from 4 to 8.2%. 8 this is driven by one large customer out of uh, Saudi Arabia that grew quite well in Q4 and a customer from uh, the PGS acquisition, which again uh, ramped up quite well. That's based out of uh, UAE. Europe also has seen good traction. We had four new logo closures in uh, Europe, UK, and the percentage of revenue uh, ticked up from around 10.2 to 11.7%. And FI20, at the end of FI20, this number was 7.2%. It's around 11.7%. Uh, so that's a good uh, improvement. It's also helping us in diversifying our revenues. Gentlemen, in the press release, uh, Executive Chairman Ashok Suta has been quoted as saying that uh, the aim for the company will be to achieve 20% organic growth uh, as you start FY22, as was indicated at the time of the IPO. Which vertical and which geographies would contribute to that 20% growth? And also, what's the plan with regard to inorganic growth? So if you, uh, I'll take the first part of the question and then let Venkat uh, chime in on the attrition, on the acquisition and uh, you know, the, uh, the growth that we would expect. But uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the geos, uh, we expect that uh, again, to continue uh, the Q4 trend, that all the geos will contribute to our growth, but we do expect uh, Middle East and Europe to, to sh exhibit a higher growth than they have in the past and uh, for that percentage of revenue, revenue to tick up. If, uh, if you see Europe, more of our revenues come from UK and their uh, uh, response to COVID is in an advanced stage. 
Uh, they have more than 50% of their uh, population vaccinated. Uh, business is beginning to open up. So we expect demand to tick up uh, out there. Europe also, is, uh, in US also is looking good with uh, you know vaccinations at around 45% to 50% of the population. Uh, there's a fair bit of optimism. And as I mentioned, you know, UAE, we have a couple of marquee customers, which we plan to build around. In terms of verticals, uh, you know, uh, we, we are luckily not in uh, the verticals that have got impacted by COVID. I think the verticals like uh, travel, transportation, hospitality, it's going up and down. Uh, there is an improvement in demand, but uh, it's still going to take time, I think, and we are not in, uh, in these verticals. So we expect uh, the, the verticals that we are present in, the edutech, high tech, uh, retail, CPG to continue driving growth. I want to call out retail because uh, the PGS acquisition that we did, 80% uh, of their customers were in the retail space. So we've got a good uh, set of uh, uh, logos to build upon and expand in with uh, some of the services uh, that are non-e-commerce around analytics, uh, IoT and other uh, offerings that uh, you know Happiest Minds has uh, to augment the e-commerce uh, offerings. And at the same time, the capability that we're getting on PIMCOR and e-commerce, we will be able to take it to many of our other customers. So I expect you know, retail to, uh, to, to contribute uh, increasingly more during this uh, year, but uh, we expect growth across all verticals, edge in industrial manufacturing, digital media, high tech, uh, retail and CPG. Venkat, you want to take the uh, question yeah. on uh, acquisition? Yeah, so uh, if you look at it, um, Ashok's statement was largely on the organic growth part. So uh, this has been kind of an aspirational number that we have put out there. Looking into FI22, evaluating the demand situation, that looks very plausible. So 20% organic growth is something that we want to continue to do and uh, keep maintaining in the near to the medium term. Uh, Venkat, coming to you on this next one, uh, margins expanded on a year-on-year -year basis, but they've uh, contracted on a sequential basis. What led to that contraction and what's the outlook going forward in light of what we're seeing? On the margin outlook, if I can take that uh, part first, we have been always, I would say, guiding or suggesting that it would be in the range of 22 to 24 percent. I've been proved wrong this whole year. And uh, the way uh, work from home will continue for the rest of this year or, or the calendar year, because we have declared work from home till end of the calendar year. And also some of the costs, uh, cost savings that came up uh, on account of the pandemic continue to uh, be in the system. So that, that's something that, that will surely continue to give the benefits. As far as attrition is concerned, we have reached the lowest point right now. Trailing 12 months is about 12.4%. Um, yes. There is a possibility that it can go down a little bit more, but I think we have kind of stabilized at the number. And uh, you're right, in in a form or fashion, higher attrition could have uh, an impact, and which is why, uh, even though we have declared 27% EBITDA for the year, uh, quarter is also about 26.3, 26.4%. I've been guiding between 22 to 24%, but the cost savings, like I said will hopefully make up for some of those numbers and we'll, we'll hold to these healthier margins, healthy margins that we have shown above the numbers that I'm guiding for the rest of the year. Joseph, this question is for you. While you have stated that the demand is strong, give us actually more color on the quantum of the deal pipeline. Also, how strong is your deal pipeline? So, you know, uh, 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 as far as the, this question came up in the earnings call yesterday as well, uh, we tracked this internally. Overall, I would say that the demand conditions are really good. And what is driving it is, uh, if you look at the U.S. market, in, in, in uh, December, customers were uh, sitting on the fence and waiting to see how the whole political situation and the COVID situation will uh, get resolved. And by end of January, you, 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 the political situation had uh, resolved itself. Things looked fine. And you also had uh, vaccination getting rolled out in a very effective manner and really picked up uh, pace in February. So we saw more optimism coming into the market. And what customers have realized is that uh, the uh, for two, two things. One is uh, you have to uh, uh, you know, do, uh, get into your digital initiatives and implement them uh, to just remain where you are because your competitors are doing it. Uh, and also because your uh, customers 
uh, and users have got used to this new way of life. So you have to adapt your uh, products and your offerings. The second is, what are your plan for three, four year time period? You have to pull that back in again to be competitive. So we've seen a real uh, increase or I would almost call explosion in demand. So that has also reflected in uh, uh, the pipeline improving. Uh, we don't really share the pipeline uh, exact numbers because uh, these things tend to be lumpy. You know, you have a five million or a two million or ten million dollar deal, and it's binary in nature. It's uh, zero or one, and it can really uh, move uh, things. Again, you have to weight it by probability. But overall, I would say that uh, the the demand is there uh, for the taking. There's uh, a lot of uh, initiatives being launched in the verticals that we are focused on. So it's, 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 it's led to a strong pipeline. Venkatraman, this question is for you. The company has declared a maiden dividend of uh, 3 rupees per share. Could you tell us what will be the company's overall uh, payout policy going ahead? So we have a progressive dividend policy. Um, uh, we follow um, a progressive dividend policy rather. Um, year over year, we would try to improve the payment of dividend per share over the past. This is the first dividend of the company is a maiden dividend. So we have allocated three rupees uh, per share, which would be about an outflow of about 44 crores. We are sitting on a cash balance of about 550 plus crores, assuming uh, that we generate an equal amount. Uh, we, we generate 50, 55 crores of uh, cash every quarter, we should be in the same place after payment of dividend of 44 crores by end of Q1. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen, for taking the time and wish you all the best for the future. Now, let's turn to pharma because that's going to be front and center today. Uh, earnings are, are uh, watched out for both uh, Dr. Reddy's laboratories as well as CIPLA. Pankaj tracks the sector very closely. Pankaj, what are the key aspects to look forward to? Well, two large important pharma companies will be declaring numbers, Dr. Reddy's and CIPLA. Both of them really need no introduction as far as uh, the world of pharma in India is concerned. Let's start with Dr. Reddy's. 22%, 22.5% in terms of margins, pack numbers at 675 crores and EBITDA of about 1,020 crores. Pa uh, sales numbers will be about 7 to 8% higher is what the street is anticipating. Again, what the management says about Sputnik, there's been a lot of news flow in and around the vaccine of Russia coming in via Dr. Reddy, so that will be in focus. U.S. sales, which is an important number, is expected to be at about 237 million and India business is expected to grow because of the work hard acquisition plus some organic initiatives. CIPLA, of course, will be an interesting one, 5,000 crores in terms of sales, PAT numbers at 620 crores and EBITDA of about 1,100 crores. Margins are expected to be about 22 odd percent. U.S. sales are expected at $146 million in this uh, particular quarter. Remember, their run rate has been now 150 million. Avutrol market share has been driving their sales in US and that continues to be the case. Market share of Abutrol new inhaler launches. Uh, what happens to the capacity of Remdivisir, which of course has been in shortage due to considering what's happening in India, COVID cases, all of these will be key questions that the management will need to answer. All right. Thank you, Pankaj, for that. Definitely watch out for both of these earnings uh, today. But on that note, we are out of time on this edition of Buy Now, Sell Now. It's a goodbye from Alex and myself. But stay tuned. Markets at noon coming up next.